How many of you like the bulletin uh, picture today? You like that? It's beautiful, isn't it? I took that shot. <laughs> As I shared with you in my uh, article in the link, um, I've been, during this Lenten season, um, been hiking around Griffith Park. And um, after uh, the, the rainy storms that has passed by and so forth, and I went on a hike not long ago, and, and I saw this spectacular view. And I said, this is God moment right now, and I need to somehow capture this moment and perhaps share this with my church folks. So I took my um, camera out and went click, and there before me was flower, and there's layers of just, it's just so beautiful, so beautiful. All I did was just click. When you, saw be when you see beauty, just click, and that's what happened. So this is from the Griffith Park uh, hiking trail, looking down toward downtown Los Angeles. It's such a beautiful place, such a beautiful place. Last Sunday, I asked you, um, as my closing sermon, to um, go to that place, you know, that location, and to look and seek for what? God moment, right? So have you done that this week? Did you do, follow through your homework? <laughs> Some of you are like, oh, Dave's taking this homework seriously. <laughs> yes? Okay. Well, if you haven't done so this past week, during the Lenten journey, open your hearts and your minds and seek after those God moments where you are touched. Okay? And perhaps during coffee hours, you could share those moments with one another and uh, feel strengthened in your faith and life together. Okay? Now, coming back to the scripture. Coming back to the scripture uh, in John chapter 3, um, a conversation takes place. And John has a way of putting light and darkness image in the context of, of the stories that he tells. And according to the gospel, Nicodemus, who was a, a, a prominent figure, um, uh, who was a teacher of the law, a Pharisee, a good, righteous man, came in the night, in the dark, right? And said, Jesus, I know you're a man of God. You come from God. And uh, um, so I trust that you are from God. And Jesus tells him, what does he say? One must be born again, right? To enter the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God that Jesus spoke of and the kingdom of God that Jesus was preaching about was about the reign of God. In other words, God is already present and that we need to participate in creating that kingdom of God in, in, in the light of the mission of Christ. So that's what he was all about. And Nicodemus was quite confused. And so there's a whole dialogue of about 11 verses that takes place with Nicodemus and Jesus about being bo what it means to be born again at some philosophical level at one point, at another level, something about the Spirit of God blowing as it pleases and that we need to be open to the heart of God. Okay? And then come this verse that we just read, these verses that we've read. And it's a well-known verse, especially John 3, 16, right? We all could recite this from memory, right? For God so loved the world, right? I, I, this was one of the first verses I learned when I was a little kid, and I used to recite that over and over and over again. The problem with this verse is that often it's been abused or used as a, a, a theological or confessional formula, as a criteria for you to be born again or for you to be saved, right? True? Uh, the other day when I was writing my uh, uh, teaser, sermon teaser, I don't know, how many of you read my sermon teaser? I'm glad some of you actually read my sermon teaser. I was uh, um, on my way to see, actually see my brother as well. And uh, he was flying in from Hong Kong, so I wanted to go see him. He was in, in the city. So I got my computer laptop and wanted to write this. And um, I was walking toward a coffee shop to you know, get my Wi-Fi and start writing and send it to Amber. And uh, I came across at this corner of 6th and Spring Street, uh, there was a booth. Um, and it says, born again. And 
uh, two young adults were wearing this bright shirt and they had these pamphlets and with the quotation of, of John 3.16. Okay? And I walked by and then one of the young adults came up to me and said, and I said, thank you, but no thank you. I, I got your message. And then I went back and I keep thinking about it. Wait a, I said, hey, wait a minute. This is a sermon moment. I have to think about this and, and because I knew I was dealing with John 3.16. But it reminded me of a time when I was a young adult. Um, do you remember Bill Bright? Anybody know who Bill Bright is? Bill Bright started a, a movement in, in U.S. campus back in the 60s and 70s called Campus Crusade for Christ, CCC. Okay. Anyway, I was part of the CCC movement back in the days. And I remember standing in that corner, handling out what he called the four spiritual laws. Do you remember some? Some of you are nodding your head, right? Yeah, the four spiritual laws. And I used to pass the four spiritual laws out and, and try to save people from the damnation of hell, that they may be born again. Now, is that what the scripture is really talking about here, you think? I was persuaded, right? The idea that if you receive or believe in Jesus, and receive as, as him as a savior, then the understanding is that you no longer will be damned to eternal punishment and fire, but that you will join life hereafter and be forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and endlessly ever and ever and ever without end, that you will be with God. Does, is that what this scripture is teaching us? Some of you are going like this. Some of you are going like this. It's very confusing, right? Okay, let me unpack this a little bit. There's a lot more to it than that. I understand how people have arrived at this kind of theology and understanding. But it reduces our Christian faith and our understanding of God, which I think really is located at the verse 17 that follows rather than the 16. Okay? 16 begins with simply these words. For God so love the world that God sent God's only child, the Son, that whoever believes or accepts him should not perish but have eternal life. What does that mean? And then follows next verse. What is it? God did not send him to what? Condemn the world, but that you may have what? might be saved, and that you may be well, have life abundant, right? right? So that's the verse that follows. For me, the best way to understand and explain this is uh, I was thinking about, okay, how am I going to un unpack this, not only theologically, but from experiential point of view, from a real human experience? So I've been thinking about this. Now, I understand we don't want to reduce our Christian faith to a, a self-preservation of here in life after that's not what it's about scripture clearly also teaches us that it's not in the nature of god to condemn or punish but that ultimately the primacy is to draw us to the very love of god and in doing so we find ourselves utterly in need of god and to trust this loving caring god okay and that we are called into the light rather than to stay in darkness. And essentially what Jesus and Nicodemus' conversation boils down to is come to the light, trust the light. But the darkness rejected the light because what? If you see the verse following, it says because they were afraid, right? They were rather be in the shadow. But Jesus invites to the light. So that's essentially what this is. So for me, thinking about this, I recall a time. You know, my brother was in town, and so uh, he, well, actually, he's now flying out back to Hong Kong. And I spent some time with him this weekend, yesterday as well, and I, we were just talking about family things. And it occurred to me that there was a Sunday many, many years ago in the 70s when my father was a pastor in Torrance. On Sunday morning, of all time and places, you got to, you, you, you don't disturb him on Sunday morning. <laughs> He's got his sermon in his head right now he needs to get ready for, right? You don't want to distract him. But I remember that morning, for whatever reason, I don't remember the detail, I got into a huge fight with my brother. We were arguing, you know, 
um, the energy in the kitchen and in the bathroom, in the living room was very, very negative. We, were, we did not like each other. Okay? But I can't remember what, what the reason was, but all I remember was that, you know, one of those silver, sibling, you know, fights in the morning. But you don't do that on Sunday morning. So we got into this fight, and uh, I remember dad walking in in the middle of it, and we just... Hi, Dad. Nothing's going on. It's all good. We, were, we found ourselves in the shadow. But he knew something was up, and he was not very pleased. You could see the anger in his face. And then we're thinking, okay, are we getting spanking here? Are we getting a time out? We are afraid of the punishment. The consequence of my deed, whatever it was, I can't remember as a child, that I will be punished. But here's what he did. This wise man that I love, he called us. David, Dave, come here. Called us to the living room. He sat. He says, now it came to my attention that you guys are arguing and that you're bickering and that, you know, he's, you're getting physical too, pushing each other. And it hurts me, he says, to see my two loving boys arguing and fighting. especially on Sunday morning when you know how important morning is for me on Sunday morning. But he says, it hurts me to see you do this. Huh? So why are you fighting? And I was afraid to come to the light and speak truth of why. Because of my deeds, I was afraid. But when he told me, Don't be afraid. Tell me what's going on. There's going to be no punishment here. Tell me what's going on. The object of his conversation with the little two boys that morning was what? Punishment? It's reconciliation. Reconciliation. And simply what he did, without saying so much words, grab my hand, grab my brother's hand. I want you guys to grab your hand. Your brothers, don't hurt each other. And then he prayed. He led us to a prayer. And when I saw him weeping as he was praying, do you know what that does? Hmm? He prayed with us, and he wept as he prayed that these two boys may grow and be reconciled and be loving carry. That was the goal and the objective. That for me, in a nutshell, breaks down this scriptural passage. Don't be afraid. Come to the light. God so loved the world that whoever accepts and believes in this truth of God's love, God's love, and when you are in the light, When you're in that truth, then you reconcile your life with yourself as who you really are, with each other and with God. Now, does that make sense to you now? It's not an eternal damnation. Or Jonathan Edwards' word, in the hands of an angry God, you're in the palm of the hang, you know, damned to hell in the hands of an angry God, right? but that God is so loving. So they, what, what, what is this all, the theology and the preaching going on in the church about heaven and hell? That's a big question, Mario. What about, what about the final justice of God and the judgment when we see so much injustice and imperfection in the world? Does that question come to your mind? It does to me, right? What then? We trust that in the light there will be a final judgment day in which all things will be perfected by the one who created us, okay? What it simply means, according to the John, is not about punishment. If you want to get what Jesus' ministry is all about, that is that it's not in the nature of God to condemn and to punish, but that those who are in darkness are already, according to the scripture, quote-unquote, condemned in a sense that you are living and continue to live in the darkness, 
and never know who you really are, never know your neighbor, never know God, because you're in the darkness. And because we are afraid. And what Jesus in his ministry is trying to solicit and persuade each and every one of us is, don't be afraid. If we have an image of a God, like a father figure who's going to be punishing you, I'll tell you what, if dad came to me that morning and said, and he took the whip out and said, come here, boys. Do you know what's going to happen to me? I'm going to be running and hiding in the closet. And I will stay there until I feel more confident to come out. But a God who comes and shares and holds your hands and says, I'm hurt when you do that. Today's anthem. Surely he bore our sorrow and he laid on himself our afflictions. And with his stripes we are healed. He will swoon before our transgression and bruise for our iniquities that we might attain eternal peace. That God is the one who is not aloof or indifferent to human suffering, but that God is suffering with our humanity and broken with us. That's what this passage means. That's what it really means. So the alternative, not the alternative because it sounds like a side dish, the real main dish, the real theology, the undergirding theology that runs throughout the scripture is not about this consent to this formula or the, the, the magical formula, okay? And you do need to have the intellect to at least consent to it to be saved from damnation and punishment. Then if you're not intellectually capable of that, then you're damned already, right? you really, really reduce the faith into something that is very marketable, fast food joint. What the scripture teaches us, especially in the light of the gospel reading, is that it's about light and darkness. It's about liberation from bondage. It's about return to exile. These are the images, actually, reading Marcus Bork, a wonderful theologian, suggests that we need to look into. Liberation from the bondage of fear, of slavery, of, of being trapped in your life in the way that you should not be, right? Liberation from the bondage, literal and figuratively. Return to exile, what was once lost to recover the self, recover the nation, right? Return from exile. It is about food, it is about drink in the wilderness, the human rights issues in the world. It is about deliverance from the life we know and live today that is given to us because God so loved the world. Look at the world. Look how beautiful this world, right? It's not about self-preservation of life here and after, forever and ever. And then how do you know? You, you, you're not, you haven't been there yet. I don't know. Yeah, that's right. I haven't been there yet, and I hope to stay here as long as I can. And beyond this life is a mystery which I cannot even theologically articulate, and I'll just leave that up to God. But what we are called here and now is about deliverance of here and now and to trust in God and not to be afraid. And the last point I want to make before my sermon gets a little long, which I really want to point out, is that the redemption and redemptive work of God calls us into the light. It's easily said and done. Coming to light is not easy because it entails being vulnerable. It means I finally have to look at myself in the mirror and see all the imperfections and shame and guilt and all the hurts and brokenness as wounded as I am. There are parts of me that I don't even want to see. I deny and I run from it, you know? And that's not the day I know. This... This, this is the day, the pastor who's got his life together, who is the model of faith. <laughs> no, no, no. You really want to, I have a stinky feet. And yes, I do fart. I am a human. <laughs> that part, you don't want to share, right? Aside from being et um, etiquette and being, you know. My point being is being exposed in the light Where's my makeup? It's not easy. But what the gospel teaches us is come to the light. 
come to the loving care of God because trust in God. God will perfect you in your life. Trust God. That is an act of faith, not to believe that you simply understand or consent to this formula of salvation because what that does is that somebody's saved and somebody's not saved. And a lot of Christians are suspect for that, right? I know a lot of Christian brothers and sisters who said, they, I don't know, he's not saved. I don't think he's saved. He doesn't, he doesn't even say exactly the way we should, he should say about what believing in God means. Right? Being in the light. The Lenten journey is exactly that. There are many ways of which I've articulated this Sunday after Sunday, being in the wilderness, being stripped away before God and being utterly dependent on God and recognizing who you really are. Right? Being in the light, being in the wilderness. Because this beautiful picture that I took, if I was sitting in the living room in the shadow, I could not have known this moment, this beautiful picture. It takes light to take pictures. Did you know that? You have to be in the light. You have to stand in that beautiful space in Griffith Park. And the light is shining. And you see the city. You see the flower. You see the mountain and the clouds just saying, blessed, blessed. I said, thank you, God. Click. That's what's going to take. That is our redemption. To redeem our life here and today. And I pray and hope that during the Lenten season that we may come to light and trust in God's saving work in our lives. God is not finished with us yet. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you are a God who trusts us, care for us, in a profound ways that we may not even understand. God, we thank you that you have called us to be your child, deserving of love and respect, and to make a difference in our world. We thank you for Christ who goes before us through the Lenten journey. God, give us the courage and faith to come to the light and see ourselves, recognizing that we are in a presence of unconditional love and light. We thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.